let me thanks for having the opportunity to discuss this. Uh, so my the structure of my talk is basically I'm going to quickly review the what we sort of have know from the point of view of research about capital flows and capital controls, uh, and then I go in the second half a little bit to the data, and then comment comment on the current situation, uh, what we get. And I should say, of course, this is I'm not an emerging country economist or central. Uh, this is a view from a, from the euro area central banking. Uh, perspective more. So so uh, I, I'll go very quickly because this is all, all pretty common ground. Many of you know it and you can look at the slides afterwards. Of course, the, 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 uh, the capital flows literature is, is ripped with various empirical paradoxes. The basic theory, basic theory says that, is that capital should flow from the rich countries to the poorer countries and it doesn't in the, according to the data. So there's uh, you know, various, various reasons for that. And, and 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 discussions of that, and 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 the you know the, it is very empirically very difficult to find these these kinds of correlations correlations that would suggest this this standard theory. So this is we are we are in an empirical puzzle, and 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 the, the basic theory doesn't seem to go. And of course you know if you go to observations for example India and China, which you know which have you know taken off well and are, are developing rapidly did not rely on foreign capital <laughs> this is one of the good examples of this paradox that they they relied on domestic financing this so the question also on the point is then well what about the financial liberalization then then this where might these these benefits be if, if they are not in this in this kind of uh, standard views and there have been some recent papers which uh, you know, suggest that there might be some broader ideas of, of benefits, something which uh, uh, various people you know, call, sometimes referred to as collateral benefits, or various sort of institutional or market structure, governance structure uh, question. But again, there, again, the evidence is very mixed. And, and, and certainly one, one idea in the literature is, has been to say that, yeah, maybe the poorest countries, you don't really get these kind of collateral benefits. Uh, but it requires a certain level of develop, development so that you can then improve the improve these uh, these aspects further. If you don't have a very if you're in a very basic situation, then that's not gonna that's not gonna help you with it. So we have this this paradox that uh, capital flows. The general view is that capital flows are probably beneficial, and 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 there are benefits. But where are they? We don't quite know in the way of of literature. So that's that's the setting uh, uh, really that we have. And then and then the question is, what about? Uh, let me then move on to the second part, which is that what about what do we know about the uh, the recent developments? I mean, you know. So I'll, I'll have some graphs about the capital flows uh, and focus on the recent developments, especially after the 2007-8 financial crisis. And there are some interesting views here. So, so here's some data. So here's one, which is which is about the debt securities internationally. What are the flows? And and one thing you clearly see here is that there has been a trend change after about 2008. After the you know with the financial crisis, there came a trend trend change. Uh, the debt security uh, securities there, the rate of growth has, has accelerated quite significantly, as you can see. See from the figure, if you go to up to about 2008, you see a little dip. That's the recession, and then then you have a very fast trend, a high, you know, high trend, and before that, a mo modest trend in capital flows into 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 these countries. So that's the debt security. What about the others? Here's portfolio investment. Uh, 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 here's portfolio investment, and and there, you know, it's the reverse. In fact, that we we had before to, we had before the financial crisis. The growth rate in 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 these uh, in, in in these portfolio investment liabilities was faster than after after the 2008-9 Great Recession. There was a decline there, but after that, the rate of the rate of growth is much more modest. And if we if we then go to uh, uh, direct investment flows, the interesting phenomenon here is that there have been fluctuations before that, but after the financial crisis. Yeah, maybe there was a little bit of increase, but that could be just uh, coming out of the Great Recession. But then from about 2011 onwards, it's flat, basically. There's basically no trend. 
So what we've seen in the financial broad picture is that is is then that the you know the debt securities build up build up of debt securities accelerated after the financial crisis, portfolio investment growth decelerated somewhat, and FDI we had pretty fast growth though cyclical before, but now since 2011 it has leveled off completely. So so the, you know the, you know the, so the. This is telling you, you are, you know, in fact, after the financial crisis, we've been having this, this sort of hot money or fast money uh, 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 capital movements in, 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 into the emerging countries very much. So that's, that's, the, that's the situation in it. And then on the other hand, we have some other developments here, which we have, which is, of course, the globalization means that uh, that it's harder to maintain closed capital accounts. You know, if you once you get into certain stages of development, you start to have international companies in the country and so forth, and they have ways of getting around capital <coughs> controls if you try to keep them. This is now, uh, uh, I've heard, you know, I'm not an expert on the subject, but this is a key issue, I believe, for some e emerging economies. And in fact, this is something which happened before. I can only refer to the Nordic countries, including Finland, in the 1980s, when we started to get major international companies, and they found ways of, of getting around the capital controls, and that eventually led to the abandonment of capital flows in the Nordic countries. So that's the that's the setting, you know. I think now, which is that we have more debt-based capital flows into emerging countries. We have this pressure from globalization to to uh, to open the capital accounts. So and and then the literature is 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 kind of uh, ambiguous, a little bit ambiguous, and not so strong, saying that where are the where are the benefits from capital account liberalization. So clearly, clearly, a modest conclusion here is you have got to proceed carefully if you have to do it, though, you know, perhaps because of the pressure, pressure from globalization. Of course, but then we also know that you can uh, find think of conditions when when this kind of liberalization could be done with with less risk than before. One, of course, is the high reserves. I mean, you know, we have now developing economies with high reserves that, in principle. Uh, allows for possibilities to possibilities to uh, go for capital account uh, liberalization, though perhaps political economy reasons might go the other way there. Saving high savings rate is another one which uh, which might might be a good thing because then, especially if you have high reserves, you might you might have uh, you might have outflows, and if you you know and the high savings rate might also induce these outflows, and that actually. Is, is, is probably again a good thing, but within limits. You know, it, it could be could be could be going too far, but in in principle it can balance the situation. Often, like in the earlier advanced economies, when they, in the 1980s liberalized the capital flows, they were usually current account deficit countries. So then you had these risks, big bigger risks. Now now you could have a more balanced situation in here. Changes in monetary policy regimes have also you know. From uh, going for more flexibility in exchange rates could also reduce the risks, but but you can't eliminate the risks of big capital inflows for it. And high trade openness again, which has uh, on the, uh, you know come at least in some countries on the basis of these of these uh, uh, globalization and more trade uh, can also uh, make the, more give some more resilience to the problems that you that might come after capital account liberalization. So let me, let me then uh, uh, move on, comment, start to comment on this, and especially start with the current situation. We saw, we saw what the debt flows were and what the structure change has been in this. And, and so this compositional change, of course, means that there is a somewhat higher risk because if you have more debt-based capital flows, you're going to have, you're going to have the risk of, of fast movements. In the, in the flows, and therefore, again, from the liberalization, this could, this could lead into difficulties. Uh, the most recent developments also, of course, you know, what's happening has, has started to happen this year and to some extent last year, is that we are starting to see also reversals. So let me just show uh, one figure, which is China. So here's the capital flows to China, and we're starting to see that 2014, and especially 15, are very different from the earlier years. Earlier years, uh, 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 though there are fluctuations earlier, 
And so this is telling if, you know, if these reversals are starting to happen, uh, uh, and, and they are happening in, in other parts probably as well in the future, then again the situation about liberalizing capital accounts is going to be again more risky. <coughs> more risky you are getting into, into, uh, into an, uh, a change in development and that could be mean, spell more risks in, in capital account liberalization. And then let me conclude with a couple of remarks about, about monetary policies which I think was also, was also in, in, in Ocampo's uh, remarks one, one aspect, which is that uh, the, the question, about, uh, question about monetary policy, you know, and, and, and if I take the US and the euro area, they basically, you know, the, the, the puzzle, you know, the difficulty is that they are geared towards domestic objectives. I mean, if you look at the mandates of, of, of central banks, central banks, they have domestic objectives. Even the, even the big ones, euro area doesn't have any, you know, if I look at the mandate of the ECB, there is no international objective there, really, except, except uh, concerning, concerning possibly the exchange rate in some situations. And similarly, the Federal Reserve in the US is, is not. So, the, so this difficulty, difficulty is that, is that they re, because there is no international objective, uh, then, then the, that, that indeed means that there's Need, and we've seen, and it was mentioned already by the first speaker, that there is a need to increase the resilience of the global financial system. But the, the current monetary policy arrangements do not allow, do not make room for that. And this, this I think, is a major development. Of course, this has been discussed many times before, and we know how difficult these kind of coordination issues are. So, so I'm not quite sure where the progress is. But one, one possibility where we might be able to do a little bit more in, in, you know, and as a way to improve, improve the resilience of the financial system is, is, is if we look at the capital flows, and, and which is that we should try, maybe via regulation, maybe some other means, to go for more, more sort of uh, security, equity and security-based international financial flows, and away from the, from the uh, fast money bank-centered finance. And, and, and unfortunately, the trend during the fi last financial crisis seems to be the opposite. So there is, an, again, another need where we might want to, want to go about, uh, think about in the future. Uh, and that this may be an easier way than finding ways to co internationally coordinate monetary policies. Thank you.